Of course, we have to be able to recognise the clinical features of hypoglycemia or a developing hypoglycemia. And there are two sets of clinical features. The first are due to release of counter-regulatory hormones. And the second group of clinical features, it's a direct effect of the lack of glucose on the brain. But first of all, let's think about the clinical features generated by the release of counter-regulatory hormones. Now, when the blood sugar level drops, especially if it drops quickly, then the body will release hormones that do the opposite thing to try and get the blood sugar back up again. Now, which hormones do you know of that will increase blood sugar levels? Well, you know that glucagon will increase blood sugar levels. So if blood sugar levels drop, that's going to be detected by the alpha cells, and the alpha cells will produce glucagon, which will start to bring blood sugar back up again. But it does take a bit of time. And as well as that, adrenaline will also raise blood sugar levels, which makes sense because adrenaline or epinephrine, it's the same thing. It's the fight or flight hormone. So it's getting the body ready to run away or to fight. And if you're going to run away or fight, you need lots of energy to do it. So it makes sense that adrenaline will increase blood sugar levels. And adrenaline gives you a feeling of general anxiety and nervousness. So the patient with hypoglycemia will feel anxious and nervous because of the effects of the adrenaline. And also adrenaline will stimulate the sympathetic nervous system and that will stimulate sweating as well. And it will stimulate the muscles, possibly causing a tremor, a fine tremor in the muscles. Adrenaline is also a peripheral vasoconstrictor, so that may give the patient pallor, a pale look. And they're also going to feel hungry. When your blood sugar level is low, that's actually detected directly by the hypothalamus. So maybe this one should be in the second group, but we've got it here anyway. When your blood sugar level is low, that's detected by the hypothalamus and that stimulates a hunger response. But getting back to the adrenaline, what effect is adrenaline, adrenaline or epinephrine going to have on the heart rate? Well, obviously, it's going to increase it. The heart's going to beat faster. And as well as that, adrenaline is a positive inotrope. That means, as well as being chronotropic, as well as making the heart beat faster, also the heart will beat more strongly. You'll increase stroke volume. And if you increase stroke volume, you can feel that as palpitations. Palpitations means an awareness of the heartbeat. So as blood sugar levels drop, counter-regulatory hormones are released, glucagon and adrenaline or epinephrine, causing nervousness, sweating, tremor, pallor, tachycardia palpitations. And the hunger might be partly an effect of the adrenaline, but also a direct effect on the brain. Now it's important to realise you don't always get all of these features, but if you do see any of these features that should alert you to the possibility that the patient is developing hypoglycemia and your response should be immediately to do a finger prick blood test to see what the patient's blood sugar is, to see if they are in fact becoming hypoglycemic. So the first group of clinical features in hypoglycemia are the counter-regulatory hormones. The next group of clinical features that can present in hypoglycemia are caused by a lack of glucose supply to the brain. Now the brain is an obligatory glucose user. It can't switch to using fatty acids or something like that. It can switch to using ketones, but that would take weeks or months for it to adapt. So basically in someone who's used to a normal diet, the brain must have glucose or it won't work. It's an obligatory glucose user. So if there's not enough sugar getting to the brain, the brain's going to start not working properly. There's going to be reduced metabolic activity in the brain 
causing abnormal function. And that leads to confusion, sometimes drowsiness, slurred speech is a real classic one. The speech just becomes slurred. Lack of coordination, staggering gait, irritability, even anger, and emotional change, sometimes tearfulness, for example. And of course, all of those are classic effects of alcohol intoxication. So very often, by lay people, someone who is hypoglycemic will be assumed to be drunk and therefore not treated. This is why it's very important that diabetics should wear a med alert, a bracelet or something saying, I am diabetic. Because all of these things are readily confused if you don't have that analytical brain or that not background knowledge or very easily confused with simple drunkenness. But of course, they won't smell of alcohol. But if the diabetic, we would have a high index of suspicion for any of these behaviours. And again, we would test their blood sugar with a finger prick test to see if they are becoming hypoglycemic. Now, if it progressed, in fact, anything that irritates the brain enough, really, eventually can cause convulsions. So hypoglycemia can cause fitting. And at that stage, the patient is really in a degree of danger because they can go on into a hypoglycemic coma. And of course, that is uh, a risk of death. They can die from that. It is a life-threatening condition. So any of those things, test the patient's blood sugar, because as we're about to see, if you think of hypoglycemia, it's actually reasonably straightforward to treat. Now, as long as you know that hypoglycemia is present and you catch it at a relatively early stage, it should be reasonably straightforward to treat. And of course, if the patient is able to give them some sugar to eat or some sugar to drink. And then once you've given them some short acting sugar based carbohydrate, give them some complex carbohydrate that will keep their blood sugar high for a reasonable period of time. But do bear in mind the patient's level of consciousness, because, of course, if a patient has got compromised levels of consciousness, we certainly don't want to be giving them drinks because the fluid can go down into their trachea and cause aspiration pneumonia, which is, of course, counterproductive. So as long as the patient is able to swallow a reasonable state of consciousness, sugar first, then a complex carbohydrate. Now, in the first aid situation, if a patient already has compromised levels of consciousness, what we can do is we can smear sugary thick solutions round in the inside of their mouth under their tongue. So at home you could use honey or syrup for this. There is a preparation called hypostop, which is a very high concentrated thick glucose gel that diabetics can keep at home if they're going to be prone to hypoglycemia. But in the hospital situation, we'll normally give intravenous dextrose. Now, in the old days, we used to give 50%, but high dextrose solutions cause phlebitis, they're bad for the veins. So 20% dextrose solution is the current thinking of the best thing to give. And give 75 mils of that as a bolus, and hopefully the patient will start waking up. If you need to give a bit more to wake the patient up, then OK, give a bit more. But then as soon as you've treated it with intravenous dextrose and the patient's woken up, then give them some complex carbohydrates to eat to keep it up for a period of time. The other thing we can do, especially in the home situation, if someone can't put up IVs, is to give intramuscular glucagon. Because, of course, glucagon will increase blood sugar levels, treating the hypoglycemia, and we can give one milligram of that intramuscularly. We've already mentioned the importance of diabetic people carrying med alerts to say that they're diabetic. And then, of course, after the hypoglycemia has resolved, which may take time, you know, if someone starts eating chocolate, it can take about 20 minutes for the blood sugar to go up. And they might not feel very well again for the next hour, so it can take a bit of time. But after that, maybe the next day, then patient education becomes very important. We need to teach the patient why they've become hypoglycemic so they can avoid 
hypoglycemia in future. We don't want this to be repeated. But to get hypoglycemia occasionally in a well-managed diabetic, in type 1 diabetes especially, you can almost consider a bit of hypoglycemia to be normal. But the key thing is that the patient recognises it and can treat it early. But if they don't know what's causing it, patient education is very important. And the other thing, that hypoglycemia in patients that have got long-standing type 1 diabetes, then they might not be able to recognise that they're becoming hypoglycemic as readily. They might not get the same clinical features. So in long-standing type 1 diabetes, especially if the patients had repeated hypos, then they might not get the same warning features until the blood sugar is much lower. And of course, that gives you a much shorter window of opportunity in which to treat it. But as long as you think of it at reasonably early stage, we can treat this. We're quite good at this.